Hello and good evening everyone and welcome to our first online London lecture of the spring term. As Rachel said, my name is Sarah Barrow and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculty for Arts and Humanities at the University of East Anglia. Tonight's speaker is Lee Marsden, our Professor of Faith and Global Politics in UEA's School of Politics, Philosophy, Language and Communication Studies. But before we hear from Lee on his research, I'd like to give you a brief update on recent happenings at UEA. As the title of this evening's lecture suggests, the inauguration of President Biden as the 46th President of the United States last month was not without contention. One of, the one of President Biden's first actions has been to sign the US back up to the UN Paris Agreement. Heike Schroeder, a professor of environmental governance in UEA's School of International Development, has said that the timing of this U-turn in the country's climate policy is excellent. 2021 will require all countries to update their nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement, including the US, in the build up to COP26 in November. The We Are Still In coalition includes around 4,000 US states, cities, businesses, universities, faith communities and tribal groups. Professor Schroeder recently stated that President Biden has demonstrated strong resolve on the matter of climate change by appointing a climate team that boasts many strong names and by making climate change one of his top priorities and putting out several executive orders on day one. There is also the opportunity for post-COVID re-energising of the economy with a much more explicit green climate smart drive. Early February saw the government announcement that there would be no resumption of face-to-face -face teaching in universities until the 8th of March except in exceptional circumstances relating to critical courses. The university's minister wrote to universities and students for information. UEA's University Council decided that UEA would continue with largely online delivery of taught programmes, except for really exceptional practice courses, to undergraduate and taught postgraduate students for the second four weeks of the spring semester, up until the Easter break. In a recent communication, our Vice Chancellor David Richardson announced that UEA will continue to provide in-person teaching and training to those students on the PSRB accredited courses that have been exempted. There will be some further allowances made to enable those where it's critical to student progression and completion to allow some on-campus activity to be supported in those practice-based courses that I mentioned. Timely research has been undertaken by Dr Harriet Jones from UEA's School of Biological Sciences into the effectiveness and impact of online learning. Dr Jones is the Director of UEA's Pre-University Skills Programme, which features a massive open online course, a MOOC, used by tens of thousands of students worldwide. University lecturers have been trialling different methods to engage, enable focus and allow students to socialise with each other. Dr Jones has recently shared top tips for students learning online, as well as the staff providing the teaching. For students, these include, include forming study groups using online platforms such as Google Hangouts and working together to go over lecture notes and talk about together what has been learnt. Dr Jones stresses the importance of creating an effective study kit at home and making use of recorded sessions to watch and take in information at the best time of day for each individual learner. At UBA, students can make use of the Blackboard Collaborate platform where they can write, draw and ask questions anonymously if they want to. Some staff have actually found greater engagement in online learning environments, especially where a student may at first be shy to participate in more direct ways when they're starting out at university. On Wednesday the 3rd of March, next week in fact, UEA and the Keswick Hall Trust present a talk on the topic of Christian persecution around the world with the Right Reverend Philip Mount Stephen, the Bishop of Truro. The talk will be introduced, as you'll see here, by a valued member of our university, Professor Lee Marsden. Which is, brings us back to tonight's talk. While we cannot yet resume these lectures in person, we're really fortunate to be able to share with you Professor Marsden's research this evening. So as mentioned, Lee is our Professor of Faith and Global Politics in the School of Politics, Philosophy, Language and Communication Studies. Lee entered higher education as a mature student in 1996 after a background in management. In 1999, he achieved a first class honours degree in politics from UEA, winning the Thomas Paine Prize for politics. 
This was followed by achieving a distinction in the Masters of International Relations at UEA in 2000. After achieving his PhD from the Open University in 2004, Lee returned to UEA to become an ESRC postdoctoral research fellow on US democracy promotion before his first appointment as lecturer in international relations at Oxford Brookes University in 2006. A year later, he returned to UEA, taking up a full-time position as lecturer in international relations. And he's remained with the school ever since, winning a UEA prize for excellence in teaching. In August 2013, Lee was appointed to a chair in international relations and has served since then as head of the school of politics, philosophy, language and communication studies. In addition to the Keswick Hall talks and lectures, Lee organised the Charles Clark in Conversation series for a number of years. He's the author of seven books, including three edited volumes and is series editor for the Routledge series on religion and international security. His latest monograph, Religion and International Security, was published by Polity Press in 2019. Tonight, Lee will share his most recent research on the topic which has gripped many of us in these difficult times, that of the recent US election. So please join me in giving a very warm virtual welcome to Professor Lee Marsden. Excellent, sorry about, uh, about that. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Sarah, for, for that kind introduction and, uh, and indeed you, the audience, for turning out and uh, tuning into this lecture. Uh, I'm told that it's the largest ever of the UEA London lectures, uh, which would certainly please at least one of the two presidents we're going to talk about tonight. It's probably an understatement to say that America is bitterly divided. Um, we've had Black Lives Matter, the uh, controversy over the 2020 election, the assault on the Capitol, um, two impeachments, We've had four years of essentially a Marmite presidency. Um, notwithstanding that, however, uh, Trump cannot simply be dismissed. Um, more Americans have voted for Donald Trump than any other American in history, at 137 million of them in the two elections. Now in this talk, uh, I want to consider two competing visions of America. Need to be mindful that everything doesn't change simply because there's a change of presidents. The divisions in American politics and society have grown bigger over the decades, not just the past four years. The question I guess we need to answer is, can Biden actually heal those divisions? And in this lecture, I'm going to suggest that the 2020 US presidential election was about character and not policy and that it is character, not policy, which will determine whether the nation can be healed or not. The character of the incumbent, people of faith, and the American people themselves. In order to do that, we need to understand the driving forces behind um, the person who Joe Biden now uh, talks about as the former guy, and the 46th president of the United States. So if you want to understand um, what motivates and drives um, Trump and Biden, then I think a useful starting point is these two books, um, which have been written not in order to contest an election, um, but actually reveal more about the candidates themselves. So The Art of the Deal, was written in uh, 1987. This is the book that Trump always proclaims as being um, his book, um, the best book that's ever been written, um, apart from maybe the Bible when he's talking to his conservative evangelical supporters. But the reality was it was uh, ghost written by Tony Schwartz, um, got a quarter of a million dollars to be able to do that. Um, and it's a fly on the wall portrayal of the Donald, revealing his business dealings and indeed his narcissistic personality. Um, Trump didn't actually sort of uh, write the, the book um, at all, what, but what he did do is he gave Schwartz the opportunity to be able to be a fly on the wall and to be in on many conversations, many business meetings, um, so that he could get a really good insight into Trump. Um, 
uh, Schwartz himself says that uh, Donald's, uh, Trump's main con uh, main contribution to the book was uh, insisting on the title um, Trump actually being enlarged. But the way that he actually ran his business, I think, is very useful in terms of considering how he actually operated in office. Um, the same way that he approached uh, the business is the same way he approached running the country. And so we'll consider those lessons, um, that, uh, how those lessons were actually applied in office. Biden's book, on the other hand, came out in 2017, uh, Promise Me Dad, um, tells the story of the death from glioblastoma or, or brain cancer of his oldest son, Bo. Moving, heartbreaking, but redemptive and revealing. Joe Biden has known sort of personal tragedy uh, through the death of his first wife and daughter in a car accident. Uh, survived the brain aneurysm um, himself, is no political disappointment. And um, more recently, which is what this book's about, is the loss of his oldest son, uh, Bo, giving him, but it gives him the ability to be able to connect with those who've experienced personal tragedy. When he speaks on the campaign trail, and indeed the other night at the White House commemora commemoration for those 50,000 lost lives, he speaks of an empty chair at the dinner table for those lost through COVID. It resonates with people. It's sincere and empathetic rather than just a political speech. Just the other night he was saying, I know what it's like when you're there holding their hands. There's a look in their eye and they slip away. That black hole in your chest, you feel like you're being sucked into it. The survivor's remorse the anger, the questions of faith in your soul. A real reaching out and an empathy um, with those people who have suffered. Very different to the approach of, um, of Donald uh, Trump to uh, dealing with the coronavirus and indeed his own um, catching of the, of the virus um, itself. Now, in The Art of the Deal, Schwartz, and uh, endorsed by, by Trump, identifies 11 sort of key factors um, in terms of doing deals um, in America. And this is sort of his mantra, if you will, of, of business dealing. Number one, and uh, most important, um, is thinking big. And he says in the book, I like thinking big, I always have. To me, it's very simple. If you're gonna be thinking anyway, you might as well think big. Most people think small, because most people are afraid of success, afraid of making decisions, afraid of winning. And that gives people like me a great advantage. In looking at that, then the Make America Great Again, is all about thinking big. It's rejecting the declinism of uh, Obama and uh, the result of the 2008 uh, financial crisis, where America had to sort of reconfigure its role in the world in terms of um, some uh, academics talk about sort of a managed decline, but certainly it's a repositioning of America um, in the world of recognizing that uh, things had changed and that it's it's difficult to to do things with uh, an economy which um, is needing to to recover. Trump sort of rejects that notion and make America great again um, becomes a key part of that thinking thing. Number two, protect the downside and the upside will take care of itself. And what he's talking about here is really the idea of sort of positive. Uh, thinking or negative thinking. And he's often talked about as being a positive thinker, as described himself as a positive thinker. Largely, I think uh, that's connected with um, his affinity to uh, Norman Vincent Peale, the author of Power of Positive Thinking. His family went to the Marble uh, Collegiate Church in New York that uh, uh, Norman Vincent Peale was a pastor of. 
and the sort of pop psychology of Norman Vincent Peale um, resonates with um, an idea that if you are just positive about things and you ignore the negative side of things, then you will be able to achieve um, whatever you want to achieve. However, although recognising that's part and parcel of what motivates him, he also in The Art of the Deal talks about uh, negative thinking and about how when he goes into a deal, um, he says, I believe in the power of negative thinking. I was going to deal expecting the worst. The argument being that if you expect the worst, then you know there's got to be an upside to, to that. It's also preparing for, um, for, for the worst eventuality. And you can make your own judgments in terms of whether that was something which played out during his uh, term of office. Maximize your options. Um, many things we could talk about. I think that uh, particularly in terms of personnel, this will be something which um, you can see um, examples of in the art of the deal. Um, and if you think about this administration that this uh, has just uh, left office, in those four years, he had four chief of staffs, five communications directors, four press secretaries, four national security advisors, four Homeland Security and counterterrorism people, um, two secretaries of state and three secretaries of, of defense. He certainly maximized his options in that area. Number four is know your market. He says this in uh, The Art of the Deal. I like to think I have that instinct. That's why I don't hire a lot of number crunches and I don't trust fancy marketing surveys. I do my own surveys and draw my own conclusions. And I think it's that gut instinct, that sort of nous, if you will, that um, we can often overlook. Um, what Donald Trump understands and what many political scientists and many liberals forget is that voting is emotional, not rational. It's not about the head, it's not about the policies so much, it's about the heart and it's about connection. And he was able to connect with uh, specific target audiences. You know, it's often said that he, he lost the popular popular vote and he did by three, three million votes um, or so. But that's really just the size of, uh, of the majority that um, uh, could be gained in California. It's a, electoral college system and he worked the electoral college system effectively and his target audience was essentially the left behind the white working and middle class not exclusively but this was a key demographic those who paid the price for the economic crash in 2008 while Obama uh, bailed out Wall Street and uh, sought to return to business as usual those who had missed out on that those who had voted Democrat and were expecting great things. Those were the people that he sort of turned to, particularly in the Rust Belt uh, states. Those who resented um, those elites who would seem to seemingly sort of despise the poor and the, the undereducated. Those purveyors of political correctness. And he was able to touch a nerve to actually hear what the concerns were of this demographic and to act accordingly. And inevitably it brings out worst instincts and it brought out instincts of sexism, of homophobia, of Islamophobia, racism, uh, gave platforms for the alt-right and the conspiracy theorists. But nonetheless, this coalition of, uh, of people are brought together uh, really by the campaign and by the rhetoric of uh, Donald Trump knowing his market. In his inaugural address, he sort of brings this to attention. He says, for too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. 
their victories have not been your victories. Their triumphs have not been your triumphs. And while they celebrated in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families across our land. For many decades, we've enriched foreign industry at the expense of American industry, subsidized the armies of other countries while allowing for the very sad depletion of our military. We defended other nations' borders while refusing to defund our own and spent trillions and trillions of dollars overseas while America's infrastructure has fallen into disrepair and decay, making other countries rich while the wealth, strength and confidence of our country has dissipated over the horizon. One by one, the factories shuttered and left our shores, not even a thought about the millions and millions of American workers that were left behind. The wealth of our middle class has been ripped from their homes and then redistributed across the world. A bleak picture that he suggests that successive Democrat and Republican administrations allowed to happen. He argued only a businessman or specifically Donald J. Trump could rectify this situation. There's another group that he also spoke to. White conservative evangelicals and here you see them praying um, with him, uh, Mike Pence himself, uh, a white conservative evangelical. You've got uh, Tony Perkins from Family Research Council there, Robert Jeffries, who's the one who's praying over him at the moment. A uh, big uh, mega church uh, pastor. Um, there's uh, Trump's spiritual advisor in the red dress, uh, Paula White Kane. Um, and they gathered round uh, praying for him. This group of people, the white conservative evangelicals, are essentially his base. 40% of the Republican Party. Between 77 this time and 81% um, in uh, 2016 voted for him. Now, Trump sort of represents the antithesis of everything that the moral majority, conservative evangelicals, used to stand for. The movement has always had a checkered history around race and uh, championed fiscal conservatism and strong leadership. Um, tends to be antipathetic um, towards anything that smacks of a social gospel, um, anything in fact which sort of emphasises anything other than individual salvation and self-help. They've been disappointed by George W. Bush, who was one of their own, and also by Ronald Reagan, and they were able to see in Donald Trump a man who would put religious freedom, you could read that as maybe the ability to discriminate against the LGBTQ community um, and uh, as one sort of aspect of, of religious freedom and also to roll back on what they saw as permissive laws on abortion and unconditional support for, for Israel. Prophecies were sort of made about him being a wrecking ball to political correctness and he would give them access to the corridors of power. A man God could use even if he was deeply flawed. And so they swung their sport behind him unreservedly. The fifth in his um, Art of the Deal, use your leverage. And he writes here that the best thing you can do is deal from strength. And leverage is the biggest strength you can have. Leverage is having something the other guy wants, or better yet, needs, or best of all, simply can't do without. American power provides that leverage, whether it's military, economic, or soft power. And he determined to, to use that power to get um, his own or America's way. Um, in the world. Number six, enhance your location. Again, this sort of goes back to the idea of sort of make America great again, and, uh, and both the geographic location, but also its location in terms of uh, economic power, in terms of its military strength, in terms of its influence within, within the world. And then number seven, uh, get the word out. And this is probably one of the key areas that, um, that, that he developed with consummate skill, um, I'd suggest, in uh, his, his four years in office. Just a selection of the, the tweets. 
Yeah, but I just want to um, read uh, what he says from, from The Art of the Deal. Um, emphasizing the positive is always uh, essential in terms of getting the word out. And he writes this, um, one thing I've learned about the press is that they're always hungry for a good story and the more sensational, the better. If you're a little different or a little outrageous, or if you do things that are bold or controversial, the press is going to write about you. And it goes on sort of later in that particular passage, the final key to the way I promote is bravado. I play to people's fantasies. People may not always think big themselves, but they can still get very excited about those who do. That's why a little hyperbole never hurts. People want to believe that something is the biggest and the greatest and the most spectacular. I call it truthful hyperbole. It's an innocent form of exaggeration and a very effective form of promotion. And I think we can see evidence of sort of um, these 30,000 examples of truthful hyperbole or lies over that course of the, the last four years. I've got the slides up uh, of some of his Twitter, um, some of his most sort of famous sort of uh, Twitter, Twitter feeds, but Donald Trump introduced Twitter um, to presidential campaigning in a way that no previous um, candidate, I suggest, um, has, has done. What he was able to do in the 2016 election was to, by tweeting at four o'clock in the morning, to actually change the entire news output for several days afterwards. He perhaps picked up on this sooner than other people, no doubt. Well, we know that uh, other politicians are using this um, as well, but I don't think anybody's been as effective as, as he has in doing this. Um, he knows how to work the system. He knows how to get publicity. And through social media, he was, uh, became a master at doing that. And particularly the use of memes. We can see some of them on the screen here, but thinking back to sort of the election, even in his, uh, to the 2016 election, even in the primaries, in the Republican primaries, he had names for each of the uh, opposing candidates. So um, uh, low energy Jeb um, would be one of them. Um, nice Ben Carson or lying Ted for Ted Cruz, his main challenger. Uh, since um, Ted Cruz, uh, can uh, Cancun um, adventure is, is trip while Texas was in um, under snow um, is now called flying Ted apparently. So that use of the mean is still is still there and effective. Crooked Hillary, of course. And in this last election, Sleepy Joe, Sleepy Joe Biden. And what he's done with memes is just give enough of um, the truth there to make it sort of stick with people um, and to, to resonate. But there's uh, what, fake news, the failing New York Times. Uh, whenever he talks about the New York Times, it's always the failing New York Times. Drain the swamp, build the wall, stop the steel. These play and they resonate and very easy for people to catch on to. Number eight, and you'll recognize and identify this, um, I think, particularly over the last four years and even over the last uh, couple of months or so. Fight back. And again, in the Art of the Deal, he writes, in most cases, I'm very good to people who are good to me very easy to get along with. When people treat me badly or unfairly or try to take advantage of me, my general attitude all my life has been to fight back very hard. And I think we can see examples of this over and over again. His treatment of the press, even where you have members of the press um, choosing to wear a face mask um, at uh, press conferences, uh, humiliating and sort of uh, ridiculing um, them. Um, abuse victims, um, you, um, the abuse which he hurls on um, people who um, are the most vulnerable um, has been something which uh, has been part and parcel of, 
uh, of his uh, character, part and parcel of, of how he governed. Um, Hillary, you know, the conflict with, with Hillary, uh, even his employees, every employee who comes into the administration is the best thing since sliced bread. And when they leave the administration, they were a total disaster. Joe Biden, um, criticism of him, Kamala Harris, uh, describing her in um, the most uh, non-flattering of, of terms. And perhaps the biggest fight back of all, the idea of stop the steal and the events which led to um, which led to uh, the storming of the capital. Okay. Number nine, deliver the goods. And again, um, if you think back to how he sort of um, tries to present policies, um, everything is the best, everything is the greatest. And so delivering the goods becomes important. So everything that Obama did in the previous administration was uh, the worst deals ever, the worst treaties ever, um, the worst economy. Um, and he was the savior who was going to uh, deliver the goods, who's going to produce the great economy in history. Um, uh, more ventilator units for, for COVID, whatever it was, he would be the one who would be showing that he could deliver the goods on it, the economy, on jobs, on foreign entanglements, um, getting uh, shot of those foreign entanglements, delivering in terms of Israel and the promises he made in the election to, to Israel. Um, delivering three Supreme Court justices, clamping down on migration. So delivering the goods that he'd promised his, uh, his uh, voters. Contain the costs. Again, I guess it goes along with sort of uh, delivering the goods, but to try and force down prices, to force down costs on everything. So you have a, a trade treaty like NAFTA, then you contain the, cross, uh, the costs by um, forcing Mexico and Canada to renegotiate. You get out of the Paris Accord because it might cost too much to uh, change your, your, your economy uh, to accommodate uh, climate change and uh, concerns over the environment. And Obamacare as well, need to make that cheaper, um, more affordable, or better still get rid of it and replace it with uh, Trump care. And then finally, um, have fun. And fun for Trump is all about winning. Not so much fun when you, you lose. Um, and he's got strategies for dealing with losing, as, as we've seen, and fights back hard. Um, but it's about being the best. He likes having the trappings of office. Even that COVID drive past when he was suffering from, from COVID as his special, uh, special service, uh, drive him out to greet his supporters so he can have a drive past and a wave. At, at them. He had fun during his, his presidency. Um, and he governed in this manner, I'm going to suggest that uh, the art of the deal reflects how he actually governed uh, the country. And it, but that struck a chord with many voters who accepted this mantra. He brought into a worldview which sees globalism as threatening, believes in the deep state, in a white nationalism, in conspiracy theories, that truth is all relative, that we're being ripped off, taken advantage of, and the only one to protect us is Trump himself, and never to be resulting in incidents like uh, the Capitol and the storming of, of that. What of the future? Is this the end? As I began by saying, you, it's impossible to dismiss um, Trump. I know Biden would quite like to sort of to forget him and to sort of to move on. Um, and there will be significant changes, and there are already significant changes. There will be policy changes. I don't intend to go into any detail about the policy changes um, and the questions, if if you like. Um, but on your screen are just a few of those areas where there's likely to be changes. Uh, taking, taking place. So President Biden has already made a start on doing some of the former guy's executive orders and will have many issues to address and will clearly change quite a number of policies, particularly geared around the three key challenges facing America at the moment, the pandemic, the environment and racism. 
and he's going to present a, a different sort of uh, presidency. Um, his words at his inaugural address um, give us an indication of that. He talks about with unity, we can do great things, important things. We can right wrongs. We can put people to work in good jobs. We can teach our children in safe schools. We can overcome the deadly virus. We can rebuild work. We can rebuild the middle class and make work secure. We can secure racial justice. We can make America once again the leading force for good in the world. No speaking of unity can sound to some like a foolish fantasy these days. I know the forces that divide us are deep and that they are real, but I also know they're not new. Our history has been a constant struggle between the American ideal that we're all created equal and the harsh, ugly reality that racism, nativism and fear have torn us apart. The battle is perennial and victory is never secure. We can see each other not as adversaries, but as neighbours. We can treat each other with dignity and respect. We can join forces, stop the shouting and lower the temperature. Without unity, there's no peace, only bitterness and fury, no progress, only exhausting outrage, no nation, only a state of chaos. This is our historic moment of crisis and challenge, and unity is the path forward. And we must meet this moment as the United States of America. But maybe um, you can't read too much into inaugural addresses. They tend to be fairly formulaic. The delivery might change. Some people would be better at delivering than, than others. Um, normally talks about force for unity, the mention of challenges ahead, the ability to meet those challenges, the exceptionalism of the United States, um, its example to the rest of the world and ends in God bless America. But nonetheless, never has it been so important for America to be united with those three challenges of the virus, climate and racism. Now, this is not a new process. The toxic part, partisanship and polarization that grips America can be traced back, I, I'd suggest, to Newt Gingrich's 1994 contract with America. And each subsequent administration has seen that partisan divide increase, with successive presidents presenting themselves as uh, the un-Clinton or the un-Bush, uh, the un-Obama, and now uh, the un-Trump. What we need to ask ourselves really is, can Biden be the healer in chief or are we destined to fight the next election with a Republican challenger posing as the un-Biden? The divisions are clear um, and I'm grateful to Pew Research Center, Pew Forum for uh, providing um, the, the research um, uh, that makes up these, these particular slides. Um, race is a, an issue. Uh, people of colour are more likely to vote Democrat than Republican, um, though, um, as you can see in terms of uh, in the middle column, the Hispanic uh, community, um, the numbers there um, are quite uh, large at 7 percent or so, um, identifying as or leaning as Republicans. So people of colour not necessarily always go to vote for uh, the Democrats, but nonetheless, there is a, a difference between um, support for, for the Democrats over, um, over the Republican Party. This is one sort of uh, The policies, I mentioned it wasn't necessarily about policies, but there are policy differences. And um, if you look at sort of going into the election, some of the top issues for Biden and Trump supporters, you can see um, some similarities there, some differences. Um, their concern or interest in certain issues might be different from um, if you're a Democrat compared to a Republican. Clearly, some issues are, have uh, a lot more interest for Democrats than Republicans, like the coronavirus uh, outbreak, for example, um, race and ethnic equality, uh, climate change, and then, on the other hand, uh, Republicans um, have areas which they are, are more concerned about as well. Um, maybe the economy might be um, an example of, of that. Um, violent crime would be um, an area um, if you look at that particular column. 
But I mentioned earlier, you know, I don't think it's necessarily just a matter about policies. You know, people will have different views across the political spectrum um, on any one issue. Um, but it's um, attitudes and the suspicions that divide more. If you look at this particular um, table, um, chart, uh, you can see how uh, Republicans uh, feel about Democrats and how Democrats feel about uh, Republicans of those surveyed in, in 2019. And sort of the idea of sort of uh, automatically seeing or significant numbers of people seeing the opposition, um, people who vote for the other side as being closed minded, being unintelligent, immoral, even unpatriotic, um, has um, significance. And um, I mentioned and uh, have mentioned about uh, about faith, and I think you know faith does play um, a big role. So I'm going to suggest, uh, perhaps naively, that the capacity uh, to change um, in America um, exists. That despite nearly 30 years of polarization. Um, in politics, there's always a constant tension between structure and agency, uh, structure of norms, organizations, bureaucracy, standard operating procedures, and then the agency of key individuals, such as the, the president. And what tends to bring about a dramatic change in business as usual comes in the form of contingency, a sudden shock like the Depression or Pearl Harbor, the end of the Cold War, 9-11, financial crash um, or the current pandemic and the attack on the capital. Such events change hearts and minds for a season. Biden's election is a first fruit of that contingency, I suggest. Uh, for that fruit to flourish and bring about lasting change requires a shift in partisanship. And I suggest the willingness of people of faith as a key demographic in facilitating that change is is crucial. See, faith um, has the capacity to both unite and divide. 79% of the American population claim to be Christian. The divisions are most acute um, in terms of sort of white evangelical support for the Republican Party. Um, as you will see from, from the chart, significant numbers of, of white evangelicals will, 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 vote, uh, will tend towards the Republican Party. Although there are indications of change in that. And uh, certainly at the last election, we start to see um, young white evangelicals drifting away to either unaffiliated um, and even to, to the Democrat. And what we also see is um, in this election, unlike previous elections really, I think is the role um, and support of the black churches for the Democrats and for the Democratic Party. Um, black voters have tended to vote and, and always tend to vote for, for, for the Democrats um, in, in recent years. Um, but the church is actually getting involved in political processes to get the vote out um, has become uh, quite important, particularly in key swing states. Uh, If you look at the makeup of the um, 117th Congress, 88% um, of the um, members self-identify as Christians. There are no atheists, one humanists. Now, it may, may be a meaningless label um, just to win votes, describe yourself as, as being a Christian. But then the question is, if it doesn't matter, then, we, well, then why self-identify as a Christian? at all. Much about the black church, the role of the black church in getting out the vote and around Black Lives Matter, I think was significant in, in 2020. Um, it's poignant that uh, Reverend uh, Raphael Warnock is uh, the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, Atlanta, uh, George, uh, um, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, home church. Is the first black man and the first pastor elected by Georgia to the US Senate. 
And his success in doing that is largely attributed to um, the organization of, of, of black churches um, as a long side of the Black Lives Matter movement and actually getting out that vote. Now, Raphael Warnock um, on his election accuses church leaders who are backing Trump with moral bankruptcy. And we have two different views really in this particular picture. There's the photo op from uh, Donald Trump after um, uh, demonstrators were, were cleared from the site. And there's uh, Joe Biden uh, in a prayer in a, in a prayer meeting. That moral bankruptcy that Raphael Warnock um, talked about can be overcome. It's, it's only in facing up to and, and turning away from that moral bankruptcy that the church can be at the heart of healing the nation. For white Christians adopting Trumpism, there's a need to look again at what is contained within the pages of that Bible that the former guy is holding aloft in this picture. They need to decide whether or not to continue to follow the false prophets proclaiming that Trump won the election and over a hundred sort of self-proclaimed prophets um, have claimed that God told them that Trump won the election after it had already been decided. Only a handful have admitted that they got it wrong. The response to those people who have said they've got it wrong and that, um, you know, Biden had actually won the election has comes at a huge cost. It comes at the cost of, of the decimation of your mailing list, the end of invitations to speak and a financial cost that's imposed and also hostile emails and abusive comments and death threats um, if you sort of go against um, this idea of, of Trump being uh, elected, uh, even though the votes uh, were against him. There are some encouraging signs, however, uh, with increasing numbers of evangelicals uh, wrestling with whether to even continue identifying as such, uh, given the identification of evangelicalism with the Trumpist wing of the Republican Party. And the chief among those is somebody called Michael Brown, a leading figure in the evangelical movement, He's recently asked, how did we become so politicized? How did so many of us end up with an almost cult-like devotion to a leader, compromise our ethics for a seat at the table and drape the gospel in the American flag? And this is a guy who um, didn't originally back Trump, but then did back him when he uh, won the Republican nomination and has been a, a chief apologist for him over the past four years. The movement so the evangelicals need to decide if it is to do a deal and trade their massive pottage back for a stake in healing the divisions and actually building the nation. Rather than looking for someone to open the doors of power to them, they need to develop the character that was so evident their divine rather than their temporal leader. Character matters, public service matters, empathy matters. For Christianity to mean anything other than partisanship in America, then the success of any presidency and of the Biden presidency will be a response to the questions posed in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Did you feed the hungry? Did you give drink to the thirsty? Did you welcome strangers? Did you clothe the naked? Did you look after the ill? And did you visit the prisoner? This is what can and should unite red and blue, Christian and those of other faiths and none, young and black, uh, young and old black and white. Joe Biden is a healer who values relationships above a party. A pragmatist who at the age of 79 still wants to 
as he writes in Promise Me Dad, help change the country and the world for the better. He ends his inaugural address with the following words. And together we will write an American story of hope, not fear, of unity, not division, of light, not darkness, a story of decency and dignity, love and healing, greatness and goodness. May this be the story that guides us, the story that inspires us, and the story that tells us, tells ages yet to come, that we answered the call of history. We met the moment. Democracy and hope, truth and justice did not die on our watch, but thrive. That America secured liberty at home and stood once again as a beacon to the world. That is what we owe our forebears, one another and generations to follow. If America can do that, then truly they'll have moved from the art of the deal to the heart of the heel. God bless you and thank you for listening. Thank you, Lee, so much for that um, wide ranging, fascinating, provocative and um, uh, reassuring in many ways, I think, <laughs> lecture, but certainly um, uh, uh, given us much food for thought. Um, before we move on to our Q&A, I'd just like to make a small request of all our audience. We're going to send around an email to everyone who's registered for tonight's event, which will include a link to a short evaluation survey. We'd be really grateful if you could take a few minutes to complete the survey, which will help us plan for future events, both online and in person. We've now got the opportunity for you to ask Lee any questions you might have. Um, to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature. Depending on which device you're watching on, you'll either find this on the right hand side or under the small icon with a speech bubble containing a question mark. We may not be able to get to every single question, but we'll do our best to pose as many as possible to Lee before we wrap up. OK, so I can see one or oh, several published. There were some great questions coming in, so uh, let's go. So we have a question here from Orla. Thank you, Orla. You stated earlier that we must not disregard Trump as over these last two elections, he's been voted more than any US president in history. But do you believe his vote count is an indicator of success which should validate his presidency when he caused so much destruction in terms of riots, social development, COVID, health care system and climate change, etc. Great, really good question, Orla. Thank you for, for that. Um, no, it doesn't uh, justify, it doesn't sort of um, exonerate his, his presidency, but it is a reality. Um, you know, there are an awful lot of people um, who voted for him. Biden got an incredible um, turnout, I mean, 81 million or so. Um, but nonetheless, you know, Trump's turnout was still the highest figure um, uh, in any election apart from, uh, apart from Biden. Um, so there are significant numbers of people who, uh, knowing all the problems that uh, uh, Trump has uh, caused, if you like, over the last four years, yet nonetheless hold on to that mantra um, of make America great and uh, support for, for his policies. That's the real challenge, I guess, that uh, Biden is, is facing. And it's going to be a challenge which um, is going to depend to a large extent. I think, you know, as I mentioned, I think the faith community has an important role to play in this because they are the key backers of, of Trump and Trumpism. And unless there's a change there, we're going to see Trump continue um, in terms of his influence um, and possibly run um, in 2024. And, you know, the longer that Trumpist element is there, then the less chance there is of overcoming that, uh, that polarization. Thank you. We've got a, uh, another question from Mark. So he says that filmmaker James Fletcher's new documentary on the 20, 2016 campaign is called The Accidental President. 
Do you subscribe to the view that Trump's bid to be Republican candidate was a publicity stunt that snowballed out of control? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, I think he's it, it, talked about several runs um, at the presidency. He's floated the idea on, on different occasions. Um, I think you're dealing with somebody who is essentially a narcissist and um, believes his own ability to be able to do whatever he puts his mind um, to do it and will convince himself um, of his ability to be able to do things. So he's accidental in the sense that he's not a normal um, candidate. But I mentioned about sort of contingency, things sort of changing and um, you, you catch the zeitgeist really of what's going on at any particular time. And he was able to tap into this in a, a, a unique way. And, you know, here's a reflection of those divisions and uh, the polarization within American society. And um, so did he just happen um, by chance on that? I think it was planned. I think there were times in the campaign where he thought that he wouldn't win, um, maybe even up to the very day it, itself. Um, but nonetheless, he was all in. And, um, and I think with the help of Steve Bannon, um, convinced himself that he could actually um, win win the election. Um, the downside of that was that um, Hillary Clinton, I think, already thought she had won the election and he was able to take advantage of that. She wasn't campaigning in key states um, and he took advantage of that. There's hubris in, uh, despite her claims after the event, it was hubris. Um, essentially, that they didn't uh, contest things as, as they should have been. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a question here from Emma. As you noted, white evangelicals were an important constituency for Trump. Do you think Biden will be able to take advantage of the divisions within evangelicalism that developed during Trump's administration? Will he be able to win over those conservative evangelicals who are not won over to Trump? Um, Yes. It, now, um, it depends who you're talking about. Um, you know, I think there will be divisions within those. Obama was able to win over some um, conservative evangelicals who had backed uh, George W. Uh, Bush. And so there are fine margins. And so what you see happening and where I think um, Biden is able to capitalize on this is that um, the the younger evangelicals in particular are more interested in things like the environment and um, don't have an issue over LGBTQ issues in the same way as their fathers and mothers do and, uh, and grandparents do. And so I think that sort of is, is quite useful, I guess, in terms of sort of thinking those people may be moving away. You also had a group of people um, who actually were evangelicals for, for Biden, who were sort of conservative evangelicals, but uh, ended up supporting um, jo Joe Biden, um, have issues around the abortion issue, still sort of um, uh, anti-abortion, and yet believe that um, pro-life policies actually do mean pro-life. So from the womb to the tomb, and you can't talk about pro-life unless you actually um, want to work with people who are perhaps suffering, in, in, uh, the poor, um, the homeless and others. And uh, so there has to be that care which is there, which doesn't seem apparent within the Trump um, uh, supporting evangelicals. And so they sort of shifted away from that. You now have people who not even want to describe themselves as being evangelical. Um, might call themselves red letter Christians, for example, from the parts of the Bible, which are sort of written in red, the words of Jesus, and sort of looking at that rather than a rather Old Testament sort of judgmentalism that seems to be the um, uh, the norm for uh, for conservative evangelicals in the states. It's a really complex picture, isn't it? Thank you. Great question from Julie as well. She says that she plans to read both of the books you featured. Which order you suggest she reads them in and why? Oh, right. OK, uh, a very good question, Julie. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it depends how you're feeling. 
if you want to get annoyed, <laughs> then the Trump book uh, um, is, is good. I mean, it is, they're both well written. Um, the Trump read is, is quite a quite a, a page turner. Um, and if you're looking at it now, um, rather than you know when it was written in 1987, you can see how he sort of lived and conducted his life in terms of his business dealings and his governmental building. Uh, I mean, I would, I think Joe Biden keeps talking about the former guy. Um, get him out the way first, read your, the <laughs> ask of the deal, and then um, to try and understand Biden, what motivates him more um, than the um, than the uh, than his book is 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 really really very very good indeed, and it helps to understand how he's dealing with coronavirus. And again, because things have changed, people um, I think voted um, for that character that he um, clearly clear, clearly demonstrates. Not the greatest speaker in the world. Um, he's not the most charismatic necessarily. Um, but you know that there's empathy there, you know that he's genuine and, mm -hmm. you know, everybody has their faults and failings and he's got many, many of those. So I'm not setting him up as being somebody who is, um, you know, a completely virtuous is, is uh, the ideal um, guy. He's the ideal guy for this particular time and moment in history where people need to heal, need to come together um, because so many people have lost loved ones. Thank you. We have so many questions, so I really apologise we can't get to all of them, but I'm going to go to George next. You mentioned um, the power of positive think thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. In what ways do you think Trump's engagement with this is rooted in the history of religion and anti-intellectualism in the US and how might it affect the heel? Mm. Yeah, that, that really is interesting. Um, and the power of positive thinking um, that um, Right. I, I'm not sure to what extent Trump himself has taken on board um, Peel's writings. I mean, it is very much pop psychology and it is anti-elite. I mean, Peel was absolutely brilliant at sort of holding audiences in radio um, audience. He, he was really one of the first people to uh, be able to use media um, in an effective way. And uh, Transform people, and I think sort of buying into the American dream and things like that, the idea that all things are possible, um, you know, that power of positive thinking still sort of resonates to today to, to a certain extent. Um, Peel would be horrified, I, I think, and certainly his family, are, um, that Trump would sort of claim to be um, one of his followers, as it, as it were, because, um, you know, Peel is, is far more nuanced, I guess. Um, very positive and upbeat, but Trump isn't always positive and upbeat. You know, his hostility towards people, you know, wouldn't resonate with with a peer. Um, what does that mean for for the future? And does it reflect? Um, it reflects a tradition. It reflects a Presbyterian tradition um, uh, that Trump claimed to sort of be, but he, he changed to unaffiliated um, this. Uh, this last election, so he's already sort of moving towards the conservative evangelical side, rather more mainstream Presbyterian thought. Um, so how's it going to play out? I, I, I don't think it will. I mean, I think um, I, I think that was a moment in, in time. And um, yeah, so I'm not expecting to play out greatly. Thank you. We've got time for one last question. Um, I had yeah, I like all the questions. I particularly like this one. How are you finding the study of these political issues, Lee, when everyone seems to have such a strong opinion? With social media, so many people seem to think they're experts. Is this frustrating for you or does it make the study of politics more interesting? Ah, nice question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's exhausting um, because everybody has something to, to say on it. So I will get feeds um, every day from anything from a, a dozen sort of uh, uh, pressure groups and sort of uh, conservative evangelicals, other sort of uh, religious groups, other sort of uh, alt-right groups and things like that. So it is um, challenging, um, but it's also fascinating just seeing how these things um, uh, play out really. Um, it's very easy if you 
concentrate on social media to exist in a bubble um, and just an echo chamber almost. So um, if you're studying this area, you need to be involved in many echo chambers uh, and take it all in. Um, but yeah, it, it makes life interesting, um, which is why I do politics um, <laughs> rather than other things. You know, we uh, love the adrenaline. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 endless, isn't it? And navigating a way through is a is a constant challenge. But but yeah, absolutely exciting and invigorating. And uh, thank you so much, therefore, for your really invigorating talk this evening. Thank you to everybody for your questions. We do have many, many more. Um, however, if you'd like to continue the conversation, and normally we would be continuing the conversation in person, so what we've done is set up um, a Facebook event discussion area. Um, if you'd like to take the opportunity to network with other attendees online, do head to our Facebook event discussion using the link that's uh, just been posted in the chat. So uh, have a go at that and uh, hopefully that provides with some semblance of what we would normally do at this stage of events. Um, if you've enjoyed tonight's lecture, and I've no doubt you have, there's also a link to sign up for our monthly What's On email newsletter, which will keep you up to date on future public events from UEA. Thank you so much and good evening. And thank you, Lee. Thank you.